Hello everyone, uh, Carl here and I'm here with Margaret Robertson. Hello. Hello Margaret. Hiya. How's it going? Really well, thank uh, And we're here in Prostatin and maybe you should introduce yourself first and tell us a bit about uh, what you do for work. Sure. Um, I'm Margaret, I'm a game designer and consultant uh, and I work for a company called Hide and Seek uh, which is a game studio dedicated to inventing new kinds of play. So we do all kinds of things, street games, board games, digital games, browser games. As long as you can play it, we help make it. Right, and so you have what might be sort of people might envy you for that kind of job, but you get to play games and think about games all day long. Or, uh, as it's otherwise known, the best job in the world. Um, right. Yeah, I have a. I've managed to pull off an entire career of having successive best jobs in the world. Uh, it is pretty brilliant. You don't get to spend quite as much time playing as you would think, but you do get to do some. Right. Um, you get spend quite a lot of your time thinking about really quite hard problems in terms of um, logic or technology or um, uh, kind of social engineering problems you spend quite a lot of time researching okay um, quite a lot of time um, in production mode actually making stuff quite a lot of time um, having conversations with people who are skeptical about play about why it's a interesting and worthwhile thing to um, spend time and effort doing um, but all of those things are you know really rewarding and really interesting so yes right. sorry everyone best job in the world so um, and at the moment you're working with us at National Theatre Wales sure. um, would you normally work with theatre companies and what kind of clients would you normally we, work with the nice thing about hide and seek is we work with a really broad range of people so we do some um, commercial work so sometimes working with brands or movie studios or uh, big companies to uh, to do big entertainment experiences that are just loads of fun. Um, sometimes we're working with um, kind of government agencies or educational agencies looking to produce games that have a real message and really try to change the way that people behave or, or think about certain um, issues. Um, and we also work a lot with cultural sector right. groups. So um, art galleries, we've just finished a game for Tate Modern, we're working on a research project with the Royal Opera House at the moment and we're doing this project with NTW cool. um, which are all projects that are very dear to our heart and there's a lot of um, musicians and, and actors as part of the um, hide and seek staff so we're, we're always really excited to work on these kind of projects. Right and um, just on the career sort of thing or the job thing uh, how, how does that sort of come to be that you, you end up designing games? Uh, what's your journey to that point? Well, I th lots of people have very different journeys. My journey was th very much through through video games. So I grew up a colossal video game nerd, um, mostly thanks to the Atari ST, um, best 16-bit machine of all time, as any other ST fans out there will know well. Um, and um, was always just was always one of those kids who liked taking the back off things to see how they worked and then breaking them and. Yeah. You know, throwing them in the back of a drawer <laughs> didn't stop me taking the back of more things so um, throughout my um, kind of teens and early 20s I was spending more and more of my time playing games reading about games writing about games looking back into the history playing old stuff pulling things apart having really really bad abortive attempts to, to develop my own uh, and eventually realised that I either would have to um, give it up and get serious or find a way to make it into a job so I did yeah. five years in, in game journalism and then moved into development and, and consultancy cool. uh, four or five years ago but lots of people have really different routes some people now do game design courses um, some people um, are complete self-starters so they may grow up modding games building their own and then now because the, the tools are so accessible and digital distribution so easy you can just make your own yeah. uh, games and, and get them out there to a paying audience and you may be able to make a living um, for it that way some people go through uh, learning kind of a particular skill base maybe you're a coder maybe you're an animator come into games that way yeah. some people come through the theatre world there's a, you know there's not many worlds now that don't intersect with games so so lots of people find different routes through oh, right. oh that's an interesting statement yeah that's really true yeah. I mean there's not if you look at the stuff that we work on you know yeah. or, or certainly that I've worked in the last you know five years I've worked on um, you know games that really you know do touch everything from healthcare to um, parliamentary systems to um, art projects to poetry to comedy to sex education to you know there's really right. there's really almost nothing now that that doesn't have some 
uh, connection with the world of gaming. Yeah, because we had a conversation before which was about um, the way that games are perceived and, and different people's opinion of the value of, of play and and so forth. Uh, we were talking about a particular journalist that had trouble reconciling, um, you know, gaming and, you know, creating time for that and finding funding for that against you know, funding things that are more, maybe more established or historically, um, you know, you don't have to justify the value of. Is there any statement yeah, on that? Yeah, there's still... Um, Game and play are both really loaded words that sometimes people struggle with, and I think often it's there's a, there's an assumption that play is either childish yeah. or pointless, and of course the minute you examine <coughs> those ideas, they they're just self-evidently false. That play um, has always had this really really strong, you know, the, the reason that it's so central to us. Um, is because it has so many, many strong dynamics in terms of being something that you do to learn or something that you do to experiment with, um, you know, different personas or different ways of handling situations. We all use play in lots of really, really useful ways. And we also don't, none of us stop playing as grown-ups. We don't think of it in the same way, but we're playing sports or we're playing bridge or we're doing crosswords or... Yeah. And there's all kinds of ways that we still express that need. So that's very much now what you see in the video game world where the, you know, the average age of, a, of somebody who plays computer games is now well into their 30s it's the average age yeah. um, this is very much not something for children anymore um, and any sociologist or psychologist worth their salt will be able to point you to masses of research that shows the extent to which play isn't trivial and is a really valuable um, important learning resource and, and mode of self-expression so for all that there is a kind of easy uh, sort of criticism to fall back on that, that it's childish and pointless it just doesn't stand up to any scrutiny right okay uh, and last couple of questions um, talk us through what you've been doing on the beach project so the, the beach is a really really interesting project I don't want to give away too many spoilers um, you know the name is the first reason that it's awesome this is a, a, a project that, that runs on the beach at Bristatton which is a, an incredible location um, and it's a really interesting project in how it brings together um, a lot of those really valuable dynamics of gaming that we've just been talking about, about how you learn from what you play and how it changes the dynamics of, of how you behave yeah. with um, the really strong elements that, that, that we know are powerful in theatre of, of um, skill performance and, and, and linear narrative, um, but also pulling in these kind of documentary elements and some of the issues that the piece wants to discuss so I'm never quite sure what to call it. It's kind of probably the world's first massively multiplayer pervasive theatre documentary game, maybe. Don't know what that acronym okay. is down to, but that works. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's you know I said at the beginning that hide and seek is dedicated to to inventing new forms of play, and I, I couldn't think of a project that fits the bill more precisely than this one. So I've just been coming down, meeting the team uh, who are devising it, um, helping um, play test some of the elements. Um, maybe share a little bit of, of our experience in designing games and, and working with audiences and making really robust, really engaging, really entertaining and thought-provoking um, bits of game design um, and just, you know, kind of seeing this project go through its, its evolution yeah. um, until hopefully you all come down and get to play it uh, when it goes live. Great. OK, thanks for your time, Margaret. And uh, is there anything else that you want to add? Um, uh, come to lovely Prostatin. It's, uh, it's, you know, the jewel of the... North Wales coast. <laughs> Great. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>